We now have an opportunity for uh, just under an hour and a half, if we want to use it, to um, uh, discuss what has been said and, and to ask questions of the panel. Um, uh, I guess we have a roving microphone. Um, do we? Um, and uh, we will use that um, so that, as far as possible, everybody can hear everybody else. Um, so, can I simply ask for comments or questions? And there's one at the back there to start off with. Um, is Lauren there? Yes, she's behind. Lauren, behind you, at the back. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it struck me, I wondered if anyone was going to mention the R word, which is religion. Um, it struck me that even before um, uh, the success, we might say, of modern capitalism, we, uh, people seemed to ignore uh, that which was written a couple of hundred years before by Adam Smith, the invisible hand, and how an element of greed, I'm not talking about greed in the pejorative sense, but if you allow people to follow their own instincts, then the, the baker and the butcher are, are out there for your benefit and everything forms itself and writes itself by people's natural inclinations. Um, but it struck me that the religious aspect to communism, uh, to paraphrase Samuel Johnson, is rather in the vein of hopes over experience. And even if it was a question of fighting fascism or whatever the other excuses were, to adhere to communism per se seems to me to be, um, well, I, I'm looking for a word that's not too, too offensive, but it seems to be not logical at all to imagine that communism, which had never shown itself to be a viable system, could ever work at all, especially as we'd had two or three hundred years of, of Western capitalism. And it, it struck me, apart from ignoring the, 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 the invisible hand, um, we, we ignored biology or sociology, which is the the natural inclination for human beings to want to keep and want to build upon that which they make. And we now understand uh, with the mathematics of biology that altruism is very tightly linked to, um, to, to one's own genetic type. And we are not really terribly pleased about giving our wealth or even parts of our, our any good that we make to other people that don't represent our genetic type and that struck me that led me back to religion which was that jesus said um, to give but he meant of your own volition but uh, never once did he mention redistribution which is not of your own volition but enforced and then going back to the religious aspect of things, Peter yes, Atkins, so when think, asked about can, can religion. Can you come, come to a close, please, yes, so that we have enough yes. time? Perhaps uh, a question might be as Yes, idea. yes, I, I will. I, I, think, I think my question is, um, um, I, I, sorry, one, one more, just one more sentence. No, the, no, the point no, is, all right, question uh, how, how, is it, how is it that people didn't recognise the difference between educated people at Oxbridge and clever or wise people that has no, no bearing necessarily on education. Uh, the wise have never uh, espoused anything like communism because they knew about human nature and Adam Smith and biology. I'm not very clear, I'm afraid. Um, I think um, perhaps I could begin by commenting that although I wouldn't claim to be religious. I do remember that Jesus said, take what thou has and give to the poor, which is a pretty good description of redistribution, just to comment on that point. Um, but uh, I don't know whether any of the panel would like to comment on the... the Peter. Well, I prefer the Sermon on the Mount as a manifesto to the communist one, I have to say. But the impulse is, I know God on the, on the human condition. I really am hopeless uh, on the human condition. But all I will say that we all exist on a spectrum from altruism to monstrosity. And in different circumstances, we live on different parts of that spectrum. And different people have uh, different versions of altruism. 
So um, that would be my reply to your question uh, or, your, or your statement, which um, I don't think will help anybody what I've just said, but that's all I can come up with. Good. If, perhaps one could make a historical remark, which is that I think, um, in a sense, you, you mentioned that communism, had, there was never any prospect that communism could work. I don't know what our panel would feel about it, but it seems to me that, in, in a sense, it's, it was, by the 1930s, still too early to tell. That is, you couldn't have concluded sensibly, or logically, in the the way that you referred to in the early 1930s, that Soviet communism would not achieve its results. Um, and uh, therefore, I don't think it's, it's quite as illogical as, as you suggested to um, have believed in it at that point. Shall we have another question? Over here, please. Thanks very much. Um, I've got a few points before I get to the question. Please yeah. bear with me. Um, my name is Jeff Andrews. I'm currently writing a biography of James Klugman. I, I'm very interested in, in uh, uh, Nick's talk. And the context is very important, I think. It's important to, as both you and Roderick said, the passage of time is important in, in uh, looking back and understanding in a more complex way, some of those tensions. And also, I think a point that John Savile's made, that much of the history of the 30s, uh, when intellectuals or middle-class recruits, and it's interesting that you use the phrase middle-class recruits, Peter uh, also talked about intellectuals, and, we, and you know, obviously we need to distinguish. But a lot of the discussion in the 30s focuses on the writers, and, and I think that's given a particular interpretation of that period and it's much broader and deep-rooted if you look at student activists you know that middle-class commitment to communism first point I wanted to make with we just have a question is whether I mean I, and I agree with the, with the trajectory you took largely but whether you underplayed the attraction of the CP as an alternative to the Labour Party in, in a small way um, the Labour Party was in crisis um, the CP was I think commended in various ways for its organizational now, its internationalism, as you said, um, its commitment to working class struggle. And I think it got the appreciation of Labour students in Oxford, for example, um, Pakenham and Crossman, their uh, recognition of Abe Lazarus, for example, in leading many of the strikes there. Um, on the question of intellectuals, and I agree with Juliet, is the party really had a problematic view of intellectuals and continued that, uh, that uh, scepticism towards intellectuals. But the contribution of Willie Gallagher in 1934 was very important, I think. It was very important, certainly for James Klugman, who saw a role for himself as an intellectual, I think, and continued to work as a student leader. And of course, was significant in the break between that sectarian period. Klugman and Cornford were, were involved with a, what, what Klugman later called a very lonely personal demonstration, Keep Culture Out of Cambridge, which was um, based on a poem by John Cornford. And then, uh, in a kind of very useful division of labour, which I think was important in the, uh, the major expansion under Cornford and Klugman's leadership in Cambridge, broadly defined, I think Cornford was particularly interested in, in the working class activism in the town. Klugman was particularly interested in cultivating intellectuals at the university, though of course his, his, his brother-in-law and sister were representatives of the town. That was significant, I think, in developing uh, the movement, that, that it was every communist student a good student. And Klugman, of course, later went on to be a leader of the World Student Association in Paris while continuing to be a postgraduate student. And as part of the breadth of that uh, movement, of course, he was visited by many uh, in the Labour movement, Eric Hobsbawm and, and um, uh, uh, Michael Young and others who subsequently went on to being quite significant politicians. So the breadth of communist influence within the Labour Party and the Labour movement at this time, the broad movement, was, was strong. But it wasn't, of course, continued after the war with a breach with the Bevanites. And I think it's, it's quite interesting how significant that moment was. Just a, a final couple of points. I think the... Um, sorry. Well, the question for Nick really was to say a bit more about the sources. If you could just, you know, obviously you've got personal interest in some of the thinkers and you draw on family archives. I'd like to know a bit more about the sources. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Nicholas, 
gets his sword. I, ho I hope I'm audible with, with this thing on me. Uh, um, yes, the, the sources for what I've been doing are twofold. The ones that you will be familiar with, which Lord Hennessy referred to as well, which is the security services and special branch, who kept a quite substantial level of surveillance across this group, but in a kind of intermittent way, so it's not a complete source. A lot of people have uh, published memoirs, reminiscences of the time. There's a whole collection of very interesting reminiscences of Cambridge students collected in socialist history, which I found very helpful. The family archive I referred to already, that's very partial, but it's been very useful to pick up some aspects. And the work that came from the Clark family archive on the Oxford University Labour Club, I think, was particularly striking in showing the popular front momentum getting going at this time. Can I, um, Jeff, just make a point in, uh, about um, academic performance? Because there's a slogan that's got into the literature about every communist student at first. Um, this is grossly misleading. Every communist student couldn't be a first. I know James Klugerman could be a double first, but a lot of Cambridge students sacrificed their academic ambitions to the party. And there are good examples of excellent communist students, two of whom became professors, who either got a pass degree or no degree at all. So I want to just chip away at that legend. Could I perhaps follow up what Jeff has said and ask Lord Healy about the, the relationship with the Labour Party? I mean, you implied that you joined the, the Communist Party, or said you joined the Communist Party because of the opposition to fascism. Um, was that a conscious decision between the Labour Party and the Communist Party at that time? Well, I mean, then as now, the Labour Party and the Communist Party, for ordinary people, have something a great deal in common. I don't think it was... Uh, at the time, however, the Labour Party was uh, dominated on one side by pacifists like Ramsbury, uh, <coughs> and the on, on the other side was rather confusing. And the CP was much clearer mm -hmm. on the question of the time, to me, which, for, for, like most people in Britain, was how to stop the war, mm -hmm. how to stop a war happening. I think, to be fair to the Labour Party, Ernest Bevin was absolutely solid where Dennis wanted the Labour Party to be in terms of seeing the menace from fascist Europe and Germany in particular. Oh, that's true. As, no, uh, and you know any better than any of us will because you work with him. But no. he was rock solid on that. And A, he couldn't stand intellectuals, even though he was very clever. And B, he couldn't stand communists. I mean, he, when he had to deal with Molotov after the war, he said, I know how to deal with this man. He's like Bert Patworth of the Transformed <laughs> General Workers' Union, who led the bus driver's unofficial strike in 1938, I think it was. And so Ernie quite simply saw Molotov as Papworth with a Russian accent. No, I and uh, he, I he was rock solid throughout. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And still am, actually. Yeah. Mm. Yes, uh, behind you, Lauren, yes. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to question the characterization of the party uh, as being devoid of intellectuals. I'm just thinking that, I, as, if, as I remember rightly, Maurice Dobbs was a med member of the Central Committee from the 20s onwards. So was um, uh, Emil Burns, uh, double first moral sciences from Oxford, and of course Palm Dutt. And I think there might have been others. So in other words, while there was a, a sort of a, a workerist pro-Soviet line, which tended to uh, identify loyalty to the, to the Soviet Union with workerism, there was nevertheless not an inconsequential number of communists, uh, of intellectuals, on, on the Central Committee. And so it wasn't so much a sort of sociological absence, but a rather an ideological position, which certainly uh, um, um, Harry um, uh, the, the uh, Pollitt was anti-intellectual, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it, it, it was the, there were intellectuals in the party from the very beginning and holding influential positions in it. And after all, that was in line with Leninist view of the role of intellectuals in the Communist Party. And I so I just wonder if there's a, there's a, uh, what I, I would 
would like to ask is, have you anything to say about the relationship of the generation of middle class intellectuals coming in in the 30s to their elder brothers and sisters who are already in the party, to relationships to Emil Burns and Palmdust and such? There, there, were, there were relationships between the 30s generation and their elder parents, as it were, parents in the party, and Cambridge is a very good example of that, where Morris Dobb was a very key influence in setting up student communism in Cambridge in 1931. Um, the role of the intellectuals in the party more broadly, not something I know a tremendous amount about, I can say, but the, but the, the basic role of the party in the early 1920s was to be a vanguard party of the working class. The intellectuals could help in that in the way that Palm Duck could be um, a very powerful influence in providing Marxist theory to support practice. But they weren't, they weren't in charge of the operation. They were simply an adjunct to it and a very positive adjunct. You didn't get an attempt to recruit the intelligentsia en bloc as opposed to individuals until the 30s. And then the party turns in the direction I tried to describe from 35 onwards and makes a virtue out of the fact that they are recruiting from the middle classes, the professionals, the technicians, the new class of the future, that chimes with the Soviet view of what the future might be. So it turns over in the 30s, but in the 20s, I agree with you, it's substantially different. Many, many hands here, perhaps at the front here. First. Thank you. I wanted to... Um, in the history that you've given us, Nick, and, and the other two historians, how anti-Bolshevism figured um, in it. None of you have mentioned the, the fact that Bolshevism was thought to be a great threat in the period that you're talking about. And uh, obviously it was overcome in, in, in during the... Uh, and about the late 30s, um, when, when Russia was thought to be, have become a great ally in the anti-fascist struggle. But was there any element, as there was later in the Cold War, of an anti-anti-Bolshevism? Oh, yeah. The, um, in the aftermath of the Great War, Lloyd George set up the Supply and Transport Organization in response to the Triple Alliance and all that, the very powerful alliance of unions that would have brought the country to a halt. The Emergency Powers Act 1920 was passed uh, with a specific intention of coping with industrial action that might be stimulated by Bolshevism. Yeah. There's a tremendous amount in those early files and that was the instrument Baldwin used to break the general strike. And it carries on today in a, because not an anti-Bolshevik model, it's called the Civil Contingencies Secretariat in the Cabinet Office. But all of that post-war planning came out uh, in the shadow of Bolshevism. And I think it was Harold Thompson, who was head of Special Branch, was somewhat obsessed by this, particularly obsessed. So for the first few years after the Great War, yes. that was part of the end of the Gordon Mutiny, of course. There were sort of eruptions of it. But the shadow of 1917 was very much across the land. Yes. Uh, understandably so. Um, and there were always accusations, were there not, that activities, certain activities were funded by red... Sorry. Um, there were always accusations that certain activities were funded by red gold. In other words, you know, they were... They were um, and indeed you know. they were. Oh, so, yes, indeed they were. <laughs> but, you know, that... College, I, which that, could do with a bit of it, actually. But that speaks to, I think, the idea of a puppet, you know, a puppet party. So, so, so the, the, the middle class were consciously going against all that anti-Bolshevism, the middle class recruits. Well, two things I, I would say. First of all, that, that following what Peter said, that, that anti-Bolshevism passes into popular culture and the use of the term Bolshe in that period and, and the, the kind of scare image of Bolshevism, they're coming for you and all that kind of thing, very strong in, in popular literature and, and popular usage. But um, Bolshevism in the, in the 30s is mediated sometimes through a delight in Russian culture, a delight in Russian culture that survives the scare Bolshevik label and becomes uh, something that can be linked to a notion of the Soviet Union as embodying the better part of, of um, the values of Russia uh, before the revolution. And that was the significance of my dwelling on Count Prince Mirsky, who consciously used the 
attraction of Russia to that generation, the late 20s, early 30s generation, as a means of propelling them into the Communist Party. But once they're there, they don't look back in the image of Russia, they look forward. They look forward to the glorious storm, they look forward to the success of the five-year plan, as they look forward to the building of the White Sea Canal, all that kind of nonsense is, is put across, but against the background of this is Russia, it's novel, it's wonderful, and Russia has always been something special that it can bring to the West. Yes. When I was growing up in, in the second half, first half of the 1940s, um, and uh, on the left in a rather undefined way, um, although in 1945 I looked at the possibility of joining the Communist Party, though I didn't, never did. Uh, but it, during that period I took for granted that had I been of Dennis's generation, uh, I would have gone to Spain. And what I don't really quite understand is uh, I understand the reasons of those who uh, were recruited, but I would have thought far more men and women at that time who shared the values which you've described, far more of them would have done some dramatic ways, perhaps not only go to Spain, but Spain was the model. Uh, my question therefore is, um, how was the line drawn and how did those who shared those sentiments but didn't actually do anything and didn't join the Communist Party? Were the strong countervailing forces of opinion, were the social democrats as strong uh, as to set against the possibility of communism? Well, that is the question. Well, it, Dennis is the one, really, because he lived through it, but it seems to me, and it's part of the problem of the dazzle of the generation we're talking about and the bigism we're talking about, is that people forget people like Evan Durbin and Douglas Jay, who were writing very, very thoughtful yes. works on democratic socialism. Yes. And I'm, I was a friend of Douglas's, and Evan Durbin died tragically just after the war. He would have been mm. an Evan Durbin. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Remarkable man. But... Douglas is forgotten, apart from one remark he never made, actually. He told me he made it up as a joke to annoy Woodrow Wyatt. But as president of the Board of Trade, when I have to go to negotiate in Paris, I don't want any of that foreign muck to eat. So I always take enough baked beans and sausages with me to see me through, which was an elaborate Douglas J joke, but it's the only thing he's remembered for. But what he should be remembered for is The Socialist Case of 1937, which is a remarkably interesting book, and in many ways very valuable for what became the Great Attlee government, in my view, the Great Attlee government. But they're not remembered, you see, because they were not razzle-dazzle. And there were, they were very widely read books, weren't they, on the yeah. left at the time. And there was a considerable pull that way, Bill, from both the literature and indeed really very interesting people. And in some ways, I don't want to put it quite as crudely as this, but the people we're talking about today got the best tunes from history because they're much more interesting. It's much more racy. There's an element of danger in it. Um, and all that, well, there, there, there never has been about good old sloggy social democracy. A social democracy, in many ways, equals tedium and, and you know, virtue. And <laughs> virtue has always been dead boring compared to a glittering ism. Could There's I, a slight could, prejudice in my voice there. I shouldn't be more careful. <laughs> could, could, could I uh, invite Peter to comment on Hugh Gates' school as another figure another from exactly that period? Yes. Um, who was actually in Vienna in 1934 yes. and participated in some quite um, clandestine activities to get people out of Vienna, so he crossed over onto the side of direct intervention, uh, but nonetheless didn't draw the moral from that that he ought to join the Communist Party. He got his head down and engaged in a great deal of work behind the scenes, developing an alternative agenda. And exactly, 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 exactly so. And so the option was there and was exercised. Also, also, there was a major Atli brigade in Spain. There was indeed. Wasn't there? Yeah. Yeah. And all of that, you know, is all too easy to forget. Could, could I ask, Dennis, uh, I mean, how much dialogue was there at the time between uh, the Social Democrats, if I can call them that, um, that Peter and, and Lord Rogers have been talking about, and the Communist Party members such as yourself? Did you see them as, as hostile or as rivals or as <laughs> comrades or what? How did you view uh, the people who didn't join the Communist Party but shared a left-wing alliance? Well, I had a lot of friends like that, 
Mm. I mean, uh, I, I didn't. I just was interested in their views. I, I wasn't against them before because they didn't join the Communist Party mm. at all. Mm. I mean, Tony Crossland and Roy Jenkins were good friends of yours at the time. Oh, really very much so. Yes. Yeah. Can I just tell one story? Because Dennis has forgotten. Now you might prompt him. When he was Chancellor of the Exchequer in '76, in the middle of an economic crisis, I mean, nothing changes. You said to me. When I was a communist in Oxford, we would debate who would get the dirty jobs under socialism. I now know the answer is called Dennis Healy. <laughs> <laughs> you did, didn't you? Yeah. I think we're forgetting the fellow travellers. Um, I think there were lots of organisations in the 30s which, well, I know one organisation in the 30s, which, which, which was an organisation of scientists called the Tots and Quats, mm. um, which w consisted of scientists who were subsequently to become really eminent. Um, I have all the names here if anybody's interested. Um, but some of them were communist members, communist party members, some of them weren't. Um, I know about this particularly because, because my father who was actually an architect, not, a, not a, a scientist, was a member of this and took, uh, was the treasurer. Um, but it makes quite interesting reading. And not, not only did it consist of people from uh, both party members and non-party members, but it was, it was able to bring in, um, particularly during the war, um, uh, uh, bring in speakers, visiting speakers, guests to their dinners um, of people in the government, the, um, the admiral of the US fleet and all sorts of eminent people like that. And I think that's a, that's a very interesting, it shows the sort of fluidity of the left. Uh, yes to that, I agree. There is a, there is a kind of middle ground and, and sometimes people talk about middle opinion during the course of the 30s uh, and people coming together around particular themes about planning, for example. Planning is a very strong 30s theme and people from quite far left and people from the centre found common ground in dialogue about the applications of planning. So I agree with you, there is a, there's a very interesting area of sharing of ideas that perhaps needs to be brought up a little bit more. Mm. And you'll find in the MI5 files a lot on those front organisations and those others which had fellow travellers within them. Yes. And uh, after the uh, Barbarossa, the, the, the Nazi attack on the Soviet Union, uh, Miss Millicent Baggett, who was the key lady in MI5, for that was her name, her card index was the key to all of this, was told to lay off everybody, including these front organisations, to her great fury. And she always had doubts about her opposite number in MI6, a man who was called Kim Philby. And, uh, <laughs> but Miss Millicent Baggett, against rules, kept the card index going. So you'll find, even in the war, quite a lot of stuff in all this. Yeah. And she was unleashed again after the war. I wonder if we just ought to define the term fellow traveller. It's not a word we use very much now. I just think what we mean by fellow traveller. Well, New Labour was a fellow traveller with the Labour Party, wasn't it? Really? So, New Labour could be described as a fellow, fellow travelling tra organisation <laughs> with a former party called Labour. I mean, it's a very difficult term, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. But this specific to this area, uh, to this era, it was those who had sympathy with some, though not all, of oh, the aims of the Communist yeah. Party of Great Britain. But the front organisations, again, were defined differently because they were communist outfits, but pretended they weren't. Mm. So again, there's a kind of hierarchy, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. But it's always difficult to define fellow travelling. But would you define the Tots and Quats as a front organisation? Do you know, I'm not, I don't know enough about the Tots and Quats. I knew of their existence, but I'd be very interested in what? what? The Tots and Quats, The Tots and Quats, the tots and quats not Totsy. Oh. Tots and Quats, the scientific organisation. What was its real name? I can't... Totem. That was its real name. It was its real name. It was its real name. And it came from a, it came, it was a, it was a classical quote which is beyond me, Tot, which was in the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it just shows how literally, I mean, everybody's second language was Latin in those days. It was very impressive. Mm. Uh, down here. Yes, here. 
why, <clears throat> why was the experience of this country on this theme that we've been discussing, fascinating, so completely different from the experience, dare I say, our comrades uh, <laughs> in uh, France, Germany, and Italy? They differ as much as the socialist parties did, because uh, <coughs> uh, well, the biggest single split in Europe is between is made by the olive line. North of the olive line, people pay their taxes, control their spending. South of it, they pay no tax and spend everything. And that sort of difference is uh, really a product of climate. But it's a very real one, and we can see it today, everywhere. Look at the Greek problem. I think the answer is that, well, Nicholas, do you want to try? I, I, I confess to lamentable ignorance about French politics, but my understanding is that the great split in the French left, 1919, 1920, took a large proportion of the mass following into the Communist Party. So the Communist Party from that point onwards is the mass party. Uh, it was never the case in Britain that that would happen. When the Communist Party was set up, it was always a small minority party. And the dynamic of its relationship with the other parties on the left dominated by the fact of its minority status, whereas in France the Communist Party was the mass party, generates a culture in the way that the German SPD does, a mass culture within which um, communism could develop in a whole sorts of series of different directions with a, with a mass following, which communism in Britain never could. <coughs> and the trade union movement reflected that. And Indeed, yes. The communist trade union yes. movement and a non-communist trade union. And ours never split in that way. Yes. Uh, just behind you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question about the 1931 election in particular. I mean, it was an absolute disaster for the Labour Party. And I really wanted to know why was it that the, perhaps that the British Communist Party could not perhaps take more advantage of the you know, downfall of the Labour government's failure to deal with, uh, with, uh, with the problems it had. And one other point later on in the decade, um, would it, how fair would it be fair to fair to say, but the Communist Party uh, in Britain, compared to, say, with France, wherever, was handicapped by some of the very awkward aspects of Stalin's rule. Uh, and I'm thinking particularly um, of the purges, the, the famine, uh, not to mention, right at the end of a decade, that the Nazi uh, Soviet pact, which I'd imagine the Communist Party would have wanted like a, like a hole in the head. Can I answer briefly the mm. first one, as well as I think I can, perhaps? The trade unions stayed with the Labour Party. All the big trade unions were loyal. The Parliamentary Labour Party was a shriveled little ruin, really, although it had some very good people in it. And it gave us Mr Attling, because um, after Lansbury had rather blown it, to put it mildly, this diminutive former Postmaster General, with all the charisma and presence of a gerbil, <laughs> was pretty well all they had, and it gave us the best Labour leader we're ever likely to get, I think. But the, the, labor, the, the, the trade union stuck with the Labour Party, that's the crucial thing. If, they, if they'd split and uh, a substantial element had gone over to the Communist Party, it would have been very different. But they stayed loyal, all the big ones, didn't they? Without no, exception. They stayed loyal, didn't they? Oh, yes. And I mean, they often disagreed strongly. I mean, we had lots of troubles with uh, Jack Jones mm. and Hugh Scanlon, the terrible twins, as we used to call them. Mm. But at least they were in touch with their members. The real problem, I think, with the trade union movement at that period was that uh, power had gone very much to the shop stewards. Mm. This is after, this is in the 60s. Yes, this yeah. is right. Mm. And, uh, and of course, now the thing is totally different because the class doesn't exist for ordinary people. If you ask a person what class he belongs to, he said, don't be silly, I left school years ago. <laughs> and uh, nowadays, uh, and because there's no class difference, the differences on policy are very much narrower. And the big disagreements today 
uh, very much on foreign policy, issues like Iraq and Afghanistan, rather than the issues of domestic policy. Can, can I just add, I know others want to come in, but I think it's relevant to the questioner's point that in 1931 you get a, a, a moral, so to speak, a moral episode, which is the independent Labour Party disaffiliating from the Labour Party on the grounds that parliamentary socialism in Britain would be impossible. And what happens to the ILP by stages, some of its whitest people defect to the Communist Party because they want the real thing, they don't want the, the vegetarian option that the ILP offers. And although the ILP at the beginning, in the, at the beginning of the 30s, is a significant force in British politics, by 1938-9 it, it's completely dropped out of the picture. So, so that was one way in which the dynamic of the relationship from the left worked out. There wasn't a third option, a third way. There might have been, but there wasn't. Hello. Uh, this is a question mostly for Lord Healy, but uh, Professor Tiki might be able to add as well. Uh, on a very human level, I was wondering what it was like for you, and uh, you said when you resigned the Communist Party, uh, when Stalin and Hitler signed the Non-Aggression Pact. I was wondering if you could say wh what was like for the sense of betrayal the people like you and, and maybe the people who joined for the similar reasons felt and, and what that's how big that split was you know the loss of membership and give us a sense you know, a personal sense for someone who's a member and a more academic sense of what you've discovered of what what it looked like well i was frankly i was very glad because i, I was getting more and more fed up with the way the communist party was changing its policy from month to month on all sorts of central issues without dis discussing it with any of its members. So that in a sense, uh, it was just a good thing I could move to the Labour Party. And also, of course, I had a lot of friends in the Labour Party in my own area, mm. uh, with whom I kept very close touch. So that, uh, as I say, it was not a problem for me at all. Mm. But was there a sense, though, that, that a, a significant bulwark against fascism had been removed? I mean, you must have, people must have felt very left behind, betrayed, alone in fighting fascism once the Communist Party had essentially removed itself. Well, it didn't remove itself from that issue. It just, um, it just lost weight with the British people. Mm. A revolutionary defeatism was a deeply unattractive concept, though, wasn't yes. it? A what? Deeply unattractive concept. I mean, of all the party u -turns Oh, the revolution, yeah. In the 20th century, that is the most nefarious, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I see it that way. I mean, nothing, nothing comes anywhere near it as a U-turn of the most monstrous type. Yeah. In the small, I think... Sorry. Sorry. In the small group I was looking at, there are two dissenters in, in the... I, I don't draw any a particular moral from that. Uh, but there were those who thought about it and didn't like it much. But when it came to the crunch, party loyalty predominated. And if the Communist International says it, and if the great hero of the 30s, Georgi Dimitrov, proclaims that this is now an imperialist war, then it must be. Um, there was a degree of willingness to accept. I see you shaking your head, but that was the way it was. And Eric Hobsbawm says, I think, that it's remarkable that the British Communist Party displayed solidarity in this way. You, you can use the word remarkable, but you could make another judgment, I think. Harry Pollitt. Harry Pollitt, Harry Pollitt, uh, Harry Pollitt dissented, but then succumbed. Well, Harry, he was, but yes, but he was, he was displaced. And then, yes, and then yes. Succumbed. Yes, and he was. Harry, uh, around here too, but uh, quite a lot of the Communist Party, it did split the Communist Party, didn't yeah. it? I mean, Harry Pollitt and uh, other people, of some Campbell. of the founders, yes. left the party, no, or at least they the were party. expelled from, or they were expelled from the party uh, because, because they, uh, they wanted to fight. The Harry Marxism. was a Bolshevik and one of Lenin's lads, but he was slain by counter-revolutionary cads. <laughs> 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 <Yes>. <laughs> I think at the back up there, yes, yes, to the 
I'm sorry, this is going to be disgracefully short. <laughs> I'm adverting to the reference that was made to Attlee having a, a sus made of the uh, threat posed by the middle class communists and the working class ones, and the fact that the authorities came down, came to the conclusion that the working class ones weren't a threat. I wondered if that might have been down to class solidarity on the part of the assessors or some sort of justified conclusion that the working class members were not capable of sufficient rational thought to organise any trouble. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. It was the MI5 assessment. Mm -hmm. And it thought the working class members of the party were concentrating on... Where, where it was wrong, I think, is, and patron, deeply patronising, was it said the working class members of the party are not that interest, much interested in international affairs. It's domestic education, health, welfare that they're interested in. But that was profoundly untrue. Yes. Every member of the Communist Party is, uh, almost by definition, and also reality, as far as one can see, supremely internationally minded. There was yes, never a more exactly. internationally minded party. That's where they went wrong. They were very respectful of the working class members, and it, what they didn't think they were dim, it's just they thought their preoccupations were different. But that's the MI5 assessment. It's not Mr. Attlee writing that paper, although his cabinet committee did, op did act on the basis of that. Uh, yes, over there. Hello, I was um, wanting to ask about Stalin, because while there's been quite a lot of focus on Hitler and the threat he posed, um, in retrospect, people very much view the 1930s onwards as um, kind of twin evils, if I may say so, of Stalin and Hitler, and there hasn't been much focus on that, so I was wondering, it's perhaps a question for Lord Healy and uh, Nicholas Deakin, um, whether that was because people saw Stalin as kind of benevolent great leader or whether it was because uh, what was going on in Moscow wasn't particularly important to British communists, he was just one man amongst many, that sort of thing. So it's a bit of a simple question, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. It's the difference in attitude towards Stalin and Hitler. Hitler being seen as the great monstrous nasty, and some people say Stalin being rather different. Yes, the, the cult of Stalin grows through the 30s, and of course it grows to monstrous proportions in the Soviet Union, and that's reflected to some degree in Britain. There's a kind of undercurrent of where a party that doesn't enthrone leaders in the way that the bourgeois parties do. But nonetheless, by, by the end of the 30s, Stalin can effectively do no wrong as far as British communists are concerned. And that, again, just going back to 1939 and the Nazi-Soviet pact, that's another reason why it comes as a shock. How could Comrade Stalin, of all people, as in the famous low cartoon I showed last week, how could Comrade Stalin, uh, among all people, uh, embrace the uh, Hitler regime in the way that he did? Um, there's a story, isn't there, in um, Eric Hobsbawm's book of the, the, the militant who was killed in the only air raid in, in, in Cambridge um, and ended shouting out, goodbye, Comrade Stalin, goodbye, Comrade Stalin, as her last words to the, to the world. Uh, and, and this reflects the way it sank into the psyche of the ordinary party members. But it, it's a gradual process. It's not an immediate process. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say what you felt about Stalin? Well, I, th I think the main difference was that Stalin was an ideological dictator uh, <coughs> who uh, was very much committed to his views on the issues on which he felt strongly, whereas Hitler was essentially a personal dictator and uh, there was nothing in his views which had much appeal to anybody except, oddly enough, Oswald Mosley in Britain. Yes. Yes, one behind you, Lauren, then you can come to the front. Thank you. Uh, right in the middle of the 30s, I think it was 1935, the Communist Party came up with a program called For Soviet Britain. Yes. Now, it seems to me, middle class yes. recruits to communism would have a great deal of difficulty <laughs> with that sort of program. Now, did, even, even if they simply ignored it, you know, they're joining a party whose program they want to ignore, which seems rather strange. If they accept it, there's all sorts of uh, contortions they'd have to get into in order to accept something like that. If they reject it, did they think there was a chance of changing it? What, what, what did they do with that uh, party program? Well, I think, frankly, in the, in the 30s, 
the basic thing about the Communist Party was uh, <coughs> its approach to the coming war. And, uh, you know, did it want one? Did it want to avoid it? If so, what would it do? And I think uh, because it was very much against uh, a war, uh, it attracted a lot of people, including me at that time. Do you remember the For a Soviet Britain pamphlet? Did you read that? The what? For a Soviet Britain, 1935. Did you read it? I can't remember. No. <laughs> I'm afraid. Nicholas, do you but I was, uh, I was still at school in 35. <laughs> But you were a clever boy at Bradford Grammar School. You were a precocious. I know student. I were a clever lad, but I wasn't very interested in politics. <laughs> I, I think the question is absolutely right. There's a very curious disparity that opens up between the Communist Party and its proclaimed platform, the 1935 Congress, of building a revolutionary Britain and the dictatorship of the proletariat, oh, yeah, with the image that later on. Mm -hmm the party wanted to put forward when beginning to cajole other left-wing groups into the popular front. And you get Harry Pollitt making speeches accepting middle-class recruits and saying we can build an alliance. It's a defensive alliance. He sells it in, in terms of resistance to fascism. But he makes it clear, quite clear, by 38, I think it is, that parliamentary democracy is a weapon that the party can use. It doesn't have to opt out. It doesn't have to go for the revolutionary solution, which it was still talking about in 1935. But the disparity was there, and the Labour Party was not slow to point it out. Um, down here. Yes. I'd like to just restate the um, social context, because we've talked a lot about fascism and the growing threat of war and so on, but the social context of a very unequal society, of power and privilege and um, a, a very out-of-touch governing class, um, and great, great hardships in society. And uh, taking that back a little bit, um, that the, 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 a working class who had been led to their slaughter 12, 10, 12, 14 years before by a, an inept governing class again. And um, I just wondered if anybody would like to comment on the effect of the, well, the, the First great, World War. The Great War legacy, every class was led to its destruction. It wasn't just the working class. Every class in this country went through that holocaust of trench warfare. But you see, it was sh the, the, the anti-war revulsion was amazingly wide. It wasn't just on the left. I mean, appeasement, the roots of appeasement are in that. Um, the anti-war impulse was the weather maker in the 1920s, wasn't it? I mean, we were the most reluctant country when it came to contemplating, right across the piece, not just on the left, uh, another war and re rearmament, you see. So the Great War impulse, it's, it's tricky if you just look at one knock-on effect of it. It was, a, it was the weather maker for the whole country and for every class, I think. Remarkably potent. It's almost hard to reconstruct it now in one's mind. I think what I'm wondering about is this, um, w this um, continued frustration, anger, and so on at the inequalities in society. Yes. Mm. Yes. I think that one of the points there is that also, I, this was in the 30s, was the time as Nicholas was talked about planning. There was also a great deal of investigation into what had been known in the 19th century as the condition of England, and large number of reports and people. And, and you know, they, some of these reports were quite scientific, but they were very inflammatory, like John Boyd Orr's report on nutrition, and just showed you know the appalling level of nutrition among you know were just not having an adequate diet, anything like an adequate diet. And, there were, and the BBC started to um, investigate you know, the programmes in S.B. Mays, the journalist S.B. Mays, and, that was, and there were radio programmes about it. So, it, it, and, and of course, J.B. Priest's book, An English Journey, in a sense. You know, these, are all, and these are all ways in which the condition of England, and in other words, the huge inequalities between those areas in the north, northeast, and Wales, where um, you know, unemployment was so high because traditional industries were you know, no longer... Um, no longer successful, and you know, slightly more prosperous Midlands and, and, and South. These were becoming, I think, 
in, in, people are becoming more aware of them, and, and that's what all the hunger marches were all about this. I mean, the hunger marches were drawing attention to those people who were supposed not to know about, you know, what was it was really like in the North. Though so if you look at things like the Times, you will find that the Times often carried extremely graphic photographs of, I mean, there's a very uh, famous series in Dur of Durham, I can't remember, I think it was 32, it could have been 33. So there was this, you know, this feeling of inequality and, 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 and frustration it was probably getting you know, more widespread. We might want to add something on the situation of women in the interwar period. Um, the casualties on the battlefield were male, uh, but the war widows who survived after the war were left with the burden of bringing up children, and a lot of the women who would have married lost fiancés or potential husbands. So there's an overhang of the war for women as well. Uh, but for the 30th generation, the, there's also the problems for the middle class. Women maybe have been protected in the middle class from the worst of the kind of things that Juliet's talking about. But there are all the professional barriers still in place for, work, for middle class women. The professions are still discriminating against women in a quite blatant sort of way. Civil service discriminated, um, local government discriminated, the education services discriminated. This is another barrier of privilege that women had to face during this period. The main effect of war <coughs> since uh, the First World War, didn't wasn't so in that war, is that it <coughs> enormously weakens the class system because uh, <coughs> men and women can go to any level depending on their ability or luck. Uh, so that, uh, and when they come out of the war, they find, you know, they may have made very great friend in other, yeah. friends in other classes, lovers are often in my case, and uh, I think that uh, it, 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 oddly enough, has enormously weakened the class system, and one proof of that, of course, was the victory of Labour in 1945, in spite of the fact that Winston Churchill had been the Prime Minister and very popular as such. Mm -hmm. I think it, it, it's quite difficult to th think oneself back or to understand perhaps how little a number of the people that we've been discussing uh, knew about um, or emotionally sympathize, could emotionally identify with the other classes. I mean, this is a, uh, just an individual anecdote, but um, it, my father um, was clearly not only horrified by the hunger marches when they came to, uh, through Oxford, but surprised. It is something that he simply hadn't known about. Uh, I remember him telling me how his, uh, his principal reaction to the hunger marches was how short they were. Mm. Um, given that I've spent quite a lot of my life working on height as an indicator of social status and social socioeconomy, I remember that particularly, that statement. But what I think it, it illustrated was that he simply hadn't had any experience as a, a middle class public school boy um, of the, the working classes. Dennis has referred certainly to what had happened to people during the war when they had mixed. But of course, by the time you get to the 30s generation that we're talking about, that mixing had not taken place. Um, and the, but the well, really odd... It was the Second World yeah, War. The Second World War, not yes. the first. Well, but the really odd thing about this, and this is where I think um, you, know, you, you have to accept that people simply didn't understand or didn't appreciate what was happening, is that his father, my grandfather, was the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Labour who, who administered the welfare cuts of 1931. So um, I can only imagine that there was some discussion in the household of um, the inequalities of the time, but it was only, really only the visual impact of the hunger marches that seems to have made an enormous difference. Mm. Of course, we're living in a pre-television age. I mean, I know there are newsreels and so on, but the immediate impact, um, I think, of that contact with the working classes 
as it seemed to be, uh, with the, um, the hunger marches was one which made an enormous impact on people. A slight addendum to the um, hunger marches and newsreels, of course one of the things was that the um, Pathé News, for example, was asked not to film the hunger marches. The hunger marches were, 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 were castigated as being communist inspired, apart from 1936, the Jarrah march, the one everyone remembers, all the early ones and such. So people didn't see the hunger marches on the whole on mm. the newsroom. They did hear things on the radio. I mean, okay, it was small, but they, there were there were feelers out. Mm -hmm. I just, however, refer to two. Th and I know that the Ragged Trouser Philanthropist published it in 1910, which described the shocking malnutrition and dreadful conditions, mm. um, was an influential book. Mm for that generation, this generation we're talking about. Also, um, middle class, upper class people who were, were recruited in to man the railways and various things during the general strike, um, some of them were radicalized by that experience because they began to realize what the working class was having to do with its time, yeah. days. Yes, interesting. So, mm. In that period, under concern in the 1930s, what was the attitude of the two universities, Oxford and Cambridge, and its staff? I differentiate between the university itself and its teaching staff to the phenomenon of some of its output, its students, graduates, engaging in the communist movement? Was it sympathetic? And what was the, you know, how did the universities themselves, its teaching staff, view the arrival of communism in England? How did the university staff in Oxford and Cambridge? Didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. Did you say the 1950s? Sorry. You meant the 30s, right. What was the attitude of the university authorities in Oxford and Cambridge to the radicalization of the student body. Uh, yeah. Differentiate please between the university authority yeah. and the university and the staff. teaching staff who might have had divergent opinions. There were always individual members of staff at both Oxford and Cambridge, particularly Cambridge, who were, were welcoming of, of radicalization among the student body. Uh, but there was also concern, and, and in Oxford, the October Club, which was the center of communist activity, was actually closed down for a bit. Um, and at LSE, uh, William Beveridge, the great Saint William Beveridge, um, cracked down very hard on student manifestations of radical behavior. There was a famous episode at LSE at the time when student newspaper outed a member of the staff as a police spy, and the man who did that was, was sent down for doing so. so there was a, a disciplinary reaction a part, on the part of the authorities. There was some sympathy on the part of the staff as a generalization. Well, I think the, I mean, the striking thing at my, my college, Oxford, was that the, uh, the master of Bailey was Sandy Lindsay, who was uh, yes. an incredibly intelligent and nice man. <coughs> he actually stood as a popular front candidate. Yes in a general election, which for a varsity of, of a university college, I think was almost totally unknown before that.